Hey, this is Dave Pryor for Leading Agile Sound Notes. We're here at Agile 2017 recording interviews all week long with speakers and thought leaders and folks that run the conference and people that have helped put Agile together so that if you're not here, you can get a sense of the kind of things that are happening and what people are talking about. And right now, Adam Weisbart is here fresh out of his session, so thanks for coming hey, by. Hey, thanks for having me. And Adam had a very positive theme talk called Surviving Backdraft, How Not to Die in a Hellish Explosion of Dysfunction. Yeah. So that's very up. Yes, yes, it can be. The outcome was, was up, but okay. um, uh, I think we've all probably been in this situation, right? We're uh, helping our team, our organization right. become more agile, and through the process, because we're helping surface uncomfortable things... That people don't want to look at. That don't want to look at, right? Uh, that um, uh, some painful stuff can come up for people, and I think without okay. talking about that and figuring out ways to manage it, like Scrum doesn't tell you how to deal with that. It just says you're going to help you're gonna see surface this, this stuff, and, and, and the then good luck. Because it, it right. depends. Right. <laughs> exactly. It always depends. Um, and so uh, I introduced folks to a set of tools that will help them manage this both within themselves, like okay. uh, when this comes up for them personally, and when it happens in organizations as well. Okay. So before we, t I want to talk about that, but yeah. first I want you to explain to folks what Backdraft is, because they may not know what it actually yeah. is. Yeah, no, that seems reasonable to explain. <laughs> um, so here's the deal. You've got a, uh, a room, there, the, a fire is like a room like this. Uh, okay. There's a fire. It's burnt out everything in the room, all of the oxygen, and everything's still glowing super hot, right? Okay. But since no oxygen can get in the room, uh, it just smolders there, much like uh, dysfunction in an organization, right? <laughs> right. Um, and as an agilist, one of your jobs is to like help open breathe the air, right? <laughs> open the door to the dysfunction. And the trick is that can explode, yeah. as you know from the... Back. From the film, Backdraft, back if you're old and you yeah. saw the movie. There you go. Um, and so firefighters have to be super careful of this. They need okay. to break windows or such before going into the room, because if you open that door, it blows up because right. you add fuel to that. Okay. And I think agility does this in large part. Like It's our job to help surface these things. Okay. Um, but getting blown up from it would be uh, so unfortunate. safely bring air into the room. Yeah. Okay. And so this idea of, of backdraft happens both on a personal level and... Um, an organizational level. So on okay. a personal level, it would be uh, difficult feelings, emotions, et cetera, that come up while you're coaching or having conversations with people. Okay. Um, it happened to me when I was helping an organization adopt uh, Scrum, and the VP there was uh, not really into actually doing uh, Scrum. And okay. so he was questioning everything I did, doubting everything I did, fighting against uh, being sure. agile, really. Uh, and that left me, in retrospect, I, I didn't have these tools at the time, but it left me feeling like, what am I doing wrong? I must clearly be doing something wrong. Okay. This isn't working. I'm not a good agilist. I'm not a good coach. Um, and so that would be an example of like um, uh, backdraft within myself. Right. This is stuff that, you know, there are insecurities I might have that are now being stirred up because we're adding oxygen to this. So that's something that most people wouldn't. I mean, out of the gate, probably wouldn't have a lot of awareness of. Like, I can see two responses there. It's either them, like that guy's an idiot, yep. or I suck at my job. Right, and that's what was happening at the time. Okay. Um, uh, in my previous talks, he's actually made cameos as well because uh, <laughs> it's great examples of, of this dysfunction. Um, and uh, it wasn't apparent to me at the time that um, really one of the things I was not doing well was managing like my state and how things were, and I was sort okay. of feeding into these flames as well. But at the time, it was all because he was doing horrible things, right? Okay. Uh, it seemed that way to yeah. me, at least. Um, so that's the idea of backdraft. It can happen on an organizational level, right? The organization has the same thing happen. Like, well, we weren't this uncomfortable before we started doing Scrum. Right. Why have you done this to us? Yeah. Scrum doesn't work. We need to change it. it happens all the time, or, right? Yeah, it's easier to go back sometimes. Yeah. Or to buy something else that might right. theoretically that's, that's safer or something. Yeah. <laughs> um, so subtle. <laughs> anyway. Yeah. Um, and so what I introduced people to in this workshop right. um, was this framework uh, or set of tools uh, called Mindful Self-Compassion, okay. um, which sounds all hippie and, and strange, um, but it's actually based on some clinical uh, research. Okay. Um, uh, Kristen Neff came out with the initial scale for measuring self-compassion, okay. um, and that scale has been used in 2,000 or so scientific papers. Okay. Um, put together by clinical psychologists and such, um, measuring effects of um, self-compassion on people and so families, an example, et What is self-compassion? So self-compassion is made up of, uh, of three things, okay. um, as she defines it. Um, so self-kindness okay. um, versus like um, being hard on yourself, right? Okay. So um, just noticing that this thing happened. Uh, what would an example be? Um, 
as a coach, like if I am in a working with somebody, right? Um, instead of being like, oh, I said this stupid thing, right? Yeah. Um, you're just like, oh, I said the best thing I could at that moment. Uh, knowing what I know now, I probably would do something differently. Okay. Um, but I wasn't stupid. I was doing my best at the time. Okay. Um, um, so it's got that. Um, it's got a, the really important part, I think, is this um, uh, shared humanity, a common sense of shared humanity. Okay. Um, so the second part is that we all suffer, right? It's right. part of the human condition. You can't get away from it. Yeah. Um, and your suffering is not different from other people suffering. Uh, and so in the workshop, we actually did uh, uh, this activity, um, like constellations, basically, where we had everyone on one side of the room. Right. And they shared uh, some moment of backdraft they had had at work, like uh, okay. internally um, or within the organization. So some brave folks stepped across the line and said, here's the thing that I, has affected me. We okay. talked about that a little bit. I sort of summarized it and then asked other people uh, that were in the room, uh, who else has experienced this? And on each one of them, you know, half or more of the room came across the line. Um, That's so we great. got so they got more awareness of the fact they're not the only one. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and this is huge, right? Because uh, to feel isolated is like, what am I doing wrong? I'm clearly not doing a good job. But right. to see that everybody has these experiences, yeah. right? Um, uh, so that's not um, in the framework for um, mindful self-compassion. It's not based around for agilists. But I saw like really strong connections to the work. Because um, uh, you're not we alone. Do as agilists. Yeah. yeah, you're not alone. Okay. Um, and then the last part of, of uh, self-compassion is mindfulness. Okay. Um, as opposed to like over-identifying with the drama or the things that are happening, right. you just notice them, right? Um, you're just present with them. You don't judge them, try to push them away. You just are present to them. So I'm going to give some examples yeah. and tell me that sure. I think they're wrong. But that guy is an idiot and he's the problem. Uh, probably not amazingly <laughs> mindful. What would probably be more <laughs> useful is like right now I'm feeling this thing. Right? I'm really angry. Okay. Um, they said something in the retrospective that hurt the other people on the team, or at least appears to be that way uh, okay. to me. Um, I, you can make observations of these things. What about, you know, we failed the sprint. I have to go into the sprint review again. I feel miserable about this. I really don't want to go. This is going to be horrible. I'm going to get yelled at. Yeah. The, I feel miserable in this is true. Okay. Um, you could just be mindful of like, that this feels, feels bad. Um, and when you're practicing uh, this mindfulness, you're not trying to figure out how to fix this thing. That's, that's where I was going to go. Yeah. 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 So it would be good to figure out how not to feel bad in the future, but that's not your job when you're being mindful of these things right. or having compassion. Uh, what is more useful, um, like one of the, I give a bunch, uh, a couple quick practices that you can do within the workshop. Okay. Um, and one of them um, has three steps. It's kind of my, my favorite thing. Um, it's first to notice that you're suffering. So just in your mind, like, oh. <laughs> This is a moment of suffering. Yeah. You just name it as that. You do this in your mind. Um, and then the next thing you say is like, uh, other people suffer in this way. There's other agilists suffering just like this. There's other people on my team probably suffering yeah. with the same thing. Um, and then just some soothing things to yourself. Um, you say like, this is really hard to feel this way. Okay. Um, so acknowledging, not fixing. Yes. Okay. Not trying to figure out how to solve it. Um, and there's more to it than that, but those are sort of the three steps so, that you would take. One of the things with this I think is important too is that it's, for me, it helps to remember it's not gonna, it's not gonna last, it's gonna change. Yeah. Like it's gonna, I'm not gonna feel this bad for the rest of my life, but that is also translated for me into when the good things happen, I have the same, that same right. awareness. So you, right. I think it can help you appreciate the positive things a little more, you can savor it a little more. Um, when the bad things happen, I think it, it takes a lot of practice, I mean, to yeah. get to that point. But yeah. To, and I, I know I can't always do it, yeah. but I try. I think and anybody can. It's happening. This sucks. Yeah. I really want to get off this airplane. <laughs> I wish they would open the door. Yeah. Someday they will open the door. Yeah. <laughs> Sometime in the next five hours. Yeah. Other people are also miserable on my plane. So what do you do with that, though? Like, if you're in that moment, like, when, you, when you're having that bad thing happen, that, you know, the client or whatever is being difficult, and you feel bad about it, Acknowledging it is one thing, and then you're just sitting there with it. Like, how do you? Yeah. Because so, the natural tendency is, I, this is bad. I have to make it better now. Right. And so that uh, just highlights, um, uh, you know, suffering is uh, pain times resistance, right? Okay. So you can't stop the pain. Like the pain's going to happen. You're stuck on the plane. Right. You're in that uncomfortable conversation. It, everybody suffers. There's pain. Um, the reason it gets amplified and gets worse is that you keep resisting it. You try to push it away. You don't pay attention to it, it comes back. Okay. Organizations do this all the time, right? Like, oh, that's uncomfortable, put that over there. Yeah. And the dysfunction just keeps, keeps happening. Um, and so 
uh, an interesting thing happens. Like if you were to sit in meditation, uh, as you know, like it's pretty easy for your mind to wander. Yeah. And when your mind wanders, um, you can focus again on your breath or whatever it is, and um, and you'll focus again for a while, and then your mind will wander. It turns out that if you stop like resisting the painful thing, <laughs> that thing will wander too, yeah. right? Like you can't if you were like, I'm going to focus so hard on this pain. Yeah. Uh, your mind will wander just as quickly with that. It only doesn't wander when you are focused on trying to push it away, because then it's like. Well, that's like, yeah. Like if you if you don't meditate when you start, I think you you feel. I, should stop, I have to stop thinking. I have to not, yes. not have any thoughts on dwelling on anything, and it's the right. same with the pain at work, too. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that's just, it's like a muscle, I think, yeah. practice it. Yeah, so in that scenario that you described, like, um, you would be present to that, and it would dissipate a bit, right? Right. Um, also, depending on the situation, there's different tools you could use. So if you're dealing with somebody who is uh, seeming to you to be very difficult, we all probably have had this experience. Right. Um, you can do a really simple practice of when they are talking, you're practicing active listening. So you're not trying to figure out what to say to them next. You're just okay. actually listening as hard as that might be. Uh, and then just take while they're talking a couple breaths for yourself, like just two breaths, not audible, because they'll probably think you're exasperated. <laughs> yeah, not like, not like that. Um, but you know, take a second. Talking, take, yeah. take two breaths. And then take a breath for them, because it turns out even if they're being really difficult, okay. they too are suffering, right? This, this common humanity so extends that's, to them as well. I think that's really important. It's one of the things I, I say in the class, because every team I've had has got like that, that, that freaking guy. guy. The yeah. freaking guy's a He's probably really smart, well, but also or super not. difficult. Oh, uh, okay. <laughs> but but this the teacher of mine of said, um, <laughs> you have to remember that everyone you meet is doing the very best they can at that moment. So right. that guy, that executive yep. who's being difficult is not trying to screw with you Yep. He's doing. He's making the best choices he can with the information he has, and that helps me have a little bit, I guess, kind of come down a few steps right. towards meeting them. I right. think, which is helpful. Right. So um, you can do this in talking with them. Right. Uh, yeah. Two breaths for yourself. One breath for them. Or uh, two breaths for yourself. One breath for them. Or if they're super difficult, five breaths for yourself. One for them. <laughs> Ten breaths for yourself. Give them something. One, yeah. Whatever. Whatever it is. Um, and it turns out, so um, I took a workshop or, uh, for this mindful self-compassion thing, okay. um, which maybe we could put in the show notes and stuff because yeah. it's uh, helpful to folks. But um, uh, many of the people were caretakers in that class, like um, EMTs, okay. doctors, nurses, right. uh, therapists. Uh, and it turns out that being compassionate is fantastic. Uh, being compassionate is a good thing, but you can suffer compassion fatigue. Uh, yeah, okay. And uh, especially in those lines of work where stress is even higher than ours, right. uh, certainly, and people can die, um, that if you're always just focused on compassion for the other person and not paying any attention to yourself, you're, you don't last long in any of those jobs. Okay. Um, and so just that breathing thing, super helpful, right? Um, taking care of yourself while having those hard conversations or dealing with that hard thing. Do you find that people, I mean, you're talking about taking care of yourself. I, it's easy for part of my brain to think, well, my job is to take care of other people. Yeah. Like, how do you, that, that would be the part that I think I would have to talk myself into to, to give myself that. Yeah. And how do you, I mean, yeah. you have advice for people that, that are as dysfunctional as I am? <laughs> <laughs> I think we all are, are this dysfunctional, <laughs> right? But, um, so I was working on my slides on my flight here, okay. uh, like sort of, you know, last responsible moment. Uh, like and one of the sessions here. Yeah, one of one of the slides that I was putting together is a guy wearing an oxygen mask. Okay, it's coming down from the ceiling, which turns out is a really bad idea to be doing on a plane because the guy next to you is like, "What the?" At least uh, you didn't have him building a bomb in the video. No, it's true. It's true. <laughs> actually, there was actually an exploding bomb in the video too, or in the slides. But nevertheless, okay. um, so here's the thing. Um, I think that stuff uh, sort of follows. You need to take care of yourself right. before. Like they say, put the mask on yourself yeah. first before the other person. Yeah. And okay. a great example of this from the Agile world is everybody thinks their problem is scaling, right? How do we make this work in the whole organization where it's rare to find a really high-performing scrum team, yeah. right? Like what would be better is to work on a scrum team. And not scale the problem of not yes. delivering. Yeah. And so what would be useful is to get really clear on these things for yourself and then okay. help others learn it as well to scale it through the organization, but not to be focused on scaling to begin with because personally we yes. have a hard time just doing it. So you talked about having these people step across the line and show whoever was brave enough to say, I've had this problem. Yeah. And, that, and they got to see they weren't the only one. That, that's sort of the other thing that I try to remember is something bad's happening and this sucks and I feel really bad about it, but it's probably happened to like at least one or 10,000 10, other right? people yeah. that have suffered this way yeah. before. If it's a work-related thing, like an agile transformation thing or something with a team, 
how do you, I mean, is, for you, are you able to just say, I know that other people have dealt with this, or do you have to go find some kind of like proof that other people are dealing with it? Like for you personally? No, I, um, I think it's partly helped by the fact that I've been doing it for a while. Like okay. there are a set of anti-patterns that come up. Yeah. Um, I, I don't have a hard time convincing myself that other people have gone through this. Okay. Um, I think that people do, and I think uh, like the activity that we did of crossing the line was really powerful for people because almost everybody in the room had crossed the line. We did like four times, okay. at least once or twice. Wow. Uh, and they did some pair shares where they talked with each other about what their experience was as well. Um, you know, I. Uh, so at work, I don't have that problem because I've had enough experience with it. Yeah. I, as you know, I have a 15-month-old uh, daughter, and You're the um, only one on the planet, Adam, with a 15. I know, I know. Daughter. And what I thought I was the only one from because of things on uh, Facebook was like in the first several months we were losing our minds, right? <laughs> like we couldn't, we hadn't slept. Uh, we were trying not to die every day yeah. or cry. Like it was just really hard. And I was like, but all the people's posts uh, on it does, Facebook, it like they're but so that happy. Always help. They're so good. They're, they're doing so well, right? Like, um, and then I started talking to people and found out like everybody else was miserable for the first many yeah. months too. That helped a bunch to like, I still felt miserable because I was sleep deprived. Yeah. But it was like, the part that went away was like the um, self-criticism of like, I'm not doing this right. I'm not okay. a good parent. I was still suffering. There's still tons of suffering. Yeah. But at least it wasn't like me inflicting it on myself, which is like, I'm not a good parent. I'm not doing this correctly. Other people are so much happier in their Facebook posts. But that's that that lack of judgment of yourself or the other, whoever it is, not yeah. your kid, but like if it's at work, if it's some other person. That's that's also something you have to teach yourself to do. Yeah, totally. Do totally. you have tips for? Um, well, my biggest tip is to grab the book and go to the workshop uh, okay. for mindful self compassion. Okay. Um, I am not a trainer in mindful self compassion. I just happen to. Um, you got a lot of value. I got a ton of value and okay. saw a lot of parallels to uh, the Agile world. And so the reason I put together this talk is I thought, you know, we'll have 150 people in the room. And if a few people leave and get something out of deep, it, that's great. Uh, dig deeper into this, uh, that'll be super useful. I think it, it's really cool that you did it because um, we talk about transformations like you talk about scaling and stuff like yeah. that. Everybody focuses on the organization. And there is this personal transformation that has to go on. And yeah, it's almost like coaching, individuals and interactions are somehow. <laughs> Um, Whatever. Um, <laughs> take a breath for me. Um, but, but that, we forget that. You know, we forget that it's totally. hard. And I think if you're coaching, you're constantly going through that. Because yeah. you might help one place figure out, but then you've got to go do it again. Yeah. And it's like walking back into that fire and opening the room. Like, Why yep. did it explode now? Yeah, totally. Yeah. So totally. what about the, the, the metaphor of like breaking the glass um, to let some of the air in? Do you have any ideas about how they can do that? Um, I think Scrum and Agile approaches do that, right? Okay. Like, I don't think we need more tools. Like, I think we surface that stuff all the time. What I don't think we have a ton of good tools for is, like, what do you do with the with aftermath of that, right? Yeah. Like, what do you, how do you manage that? Like, now I'm in this room that's still really hot, even though it didn't explode. What do I do? Yeah. Um, I, you know, uh, some forward. folks, you know, dig into that a bit, but there's not, it's basically like, now you deal with it. Well, okay, what do I do? I okay. feel really uncomfortable. How do you, um, you know, you talked about giving yourself a little bit, giving yourself a minute, kind of acknowledging maybe this is hard, maybe I don't know, you know, not done this before. It's, yeah. it's normal to struggle in this. One of the things that I worry about there is this line between I'm giving myself kind of a, okay, you know what, just it's fine. And I'm always worried about it just becoming an excuse to let myself get away with stuff. Yeah. So I was really worried about this, too, because um, per, on a personal level, to be perfectly honest, like I'm pretty self-critical about stuff, or I have been right. in the past. Um, and part of the reason was, is like, I was like, I'm successful because I drive myself forward, right? right. Um, and uh, it turns out uh, lots of folks um, have this concern. And it's like more, uh, I learned from the workshop, like more predominant in men as well, right? Like this is a, uh, a driven thing. And... Um, it turns out one of the couple thousand studies that are based on her um, assessment of, of, um, of things uh, on her scale is that uh, mindful self-compassion or self-compassion right. actually leads to better outcomes. Uh, it, and it, it's like Dan Pink's work, right? Like okay. you, the carrot and stick approach doesn't really work in the long run um, in complex thought work like software development. Right. And it turns out the carrot and stick approach for driving yourself forward doesn't work either. 
in the long run, and that uh, self uh, self compassionate people okay. that hi score higher on the scale yeah. um, are um, are more successful. Um, have better sustainable pace because they're not worrying, wearing themselves out all the time. Like you can keep that up for wow. probably years, yeah. but it does. <laughs> Take it, a toll. Yeah, it takes a toll. Yeah. And that's all energy you could be using towards actually solving the problem. Okay. Plus when you're in that mode of like, I just need to drive forward, yeah. um, you're in a bit of often like fight or flight, right? You can't come up with creative I, solutions. I think, I think that. that's so important. I think that that becomes like you're operating. Yes. Like your whole system is. Yeah, everything and everything is gets like, like Everything gets narrow. You don't necessarily see other solutions. Yeah. You're very like um, uh, you have object or uh, target fixation. Yeah. Um, you can't be particularly creative. Um, self compassion doesn't uh, doesn't do that. Yeah. Um, so I want to ask you one more question about this. Sure. Um, how would you define mindfulness? Because that is a term that is being used almost as much as the word agile now. Right. And and I would say with a wide range of understanding of what it means. Yeah. So what's your explanation of what it means? Um, seeing things as best we can as they are, right? Okay. Um, and so in, in, in the self-compassion framework, um, it's mindfulness uh, versus over-identification. So getting really wrapped up in the story, the okay. drama, the, the things that are actually not currently happening in many okay. cases, right? Um, it's happening inside, yeah. but it's not happening. It's not the thing life. that's happening, yeah. right? Um, might, it's like an outcome of that, but that's not. Um, uh, I personally, in the past, especially like with Agile Transformations, have got really wrapped up in the story and the drama that's going on because of those things. Right. Whereas if I was mindful just noticing what was happening and making those visible to people and such, we probably would have had better outcomes or at least less stressful outcomes. Okay. So, um, how, so would you, how would you, I mean, you practice a decent so, amount of Yeah, and I was just thinking, like, when you, when you started to talk, I'm hearing your words, and I'm also adding stuff to the end of it in my head. Yeah. Like, I'm like, flying, like, this is hysterical. We're talking about mindfulness, and I'm just, like, tacking things on to your phrases. And <laughs> well, what did you add? Well, I can't even remember, because I already woke <laughs> up. But um, it was however you started to describe it, and it was, and you, you kind of brought the, you said the thing like a minute later, a couple yeah. seconds later. But um, I think that it's about trying to have awareness without judgment, and yeah. to be aware of what's going on at a moment. And I think for me, the thing that I struggle with the most is that it seems to like people feel like if you're mindful, it's a, it's a constant never-ending state of hyper-awareness, and that's the thing that I would struggle with, because like, mm. I know people that will, you know, when they walk, they want to feel every single part of their foot touch the ground, Right. and, and I don't think that's sustainable constantly, yeah. at least not for me. Yeah, yeah, right? so the cool thing about mindful self-compassion and not just mindfulness um, is that like when you're like, oh, I should be able to focus on my footfall better because that yeah, other guy can. Bad mindful person. Yeah, that's not, <laughs> that's not really compassionate, right? Um, and so the mindful self-compassion like sort of toolkit has yeah. these in the moment practices like I mentioned, but it also okay. has some guided sitting mindfulness exercises. Okay. Um, and what I found was when I sort of did like sitting mindfulness prior to this and then discovered uh, uh, this instead, um, I've actually enjoyed this way more because before I was like, I just need to, I, I, I need to be a better, yeah. <laughs> more mindful. I need to be more but mindful. That's, but that's the, pr I think that's why to me it's like a muscle you have to practice. It's like when people start to meditate or do anything like this, you're going to suck at it in the beginning. And you're going to judge yourself constantly. And it's not that you suck. It's just that you're so gonna used feel to like telling you yourself. Right. Yeah. Right. And it's, it's just you're doing what you are yeah. where you are. And if it's the beginning of something, it's the beginning of something. Yeah. And so the, the self-compassion part, I think, is super helpful for that. It's made it a lot more enjoyable yeah. for me. Cool. Um, and it's cool. They, they have done studies also on these sort of in the moment practices, like the one I kind of outlined at the beginning here, and then the longer form, like 20 minute sessions. Okay. Uh, and they found out that is, if you do them regularly, right. uh, it doesn't matter if you do the in the moment things or the longer form things or a mixture of the two, it's just as effective. So they measure the efficacy um, across okay. a couple of groups. And it turns out it doesn't matter which one you do as long as you do them regularly. So the, especially the in the moment things, you can do, there's a handful of them, there's 10 or 20. Okay. Um, and you can do different ones throughout the day as stuff appears. Um, it's great. It's like cool. super, super low uh, overhead. All right. So, I, and if you're curious about this stuff, I would, I guess the thing I would want to encourage is that people just try, take any step in the direction. Yeah. Don't worry about being like an expert at something. It's just, yeah. even the, any attempt will make you better at what you're doing. 
Yeah. For, and not just for yourself, but for the people that you're working with. Yep. Right? Totally. You can totally be a better coach when you are less reactive, it turns out. You yeah. can facilitate better and um, help more see people. things more clearly. Do the agile. Do the agile. <laughs> So be the um, agile. All right, so we're gonna when we put this up, we'll put in show notes that will link to the stuff that you're talking yeah. about. But what if they want to find out more about you and the work that you do? Uh, you can go to wisebart.com. Okay. Uh, there's information uh, there, uh, and soon, uh, maybe in the next couple of weeks, uh, there will be a page up at uh, uh, mindfulagilist.com. Okay. Um, and the goal with that actually is um, one of the things I found useful from the mindful self-compassion uh, sessions that I did was that there's a virtu some virtual sessions as well. So okay. meet for like an hour um, via video conference uh, and just um, do um, some mindfulness activity um, that you could take throughout your day and such. Okay. Um, and so I want to set that up as well. Um, and you and I chatted a little bit about yeah. that. It sounds like you're going to help me out with that yep. too. So we'll like once a month or so we will have um, uh, some mindfulness for agilists. Cool. Uh, and so if you're at all interested, uh, it will be free. Uh, it'll just take an hour. You can check it out and see what, how you feel about it. Um, but yeah, I've, this stuff has been so helpful both in work and uh, in my personal life that I'd love more people to, to check it out. Cool. All right, dude. Thanks for coming Thanks by. Thanks for coming. Safe trip home. Thanks for having me. And thank you for watching. <laughs> so check the show notes, check the stuff out, and we'll also put in the link to the site as soon as it's up. Awesome. Cool. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you.